Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. We're going to bring a fun episode today. When I was in the military and in law enforcement, there was this term called everyday carry, which kind of referred to the protections that you would carry around in your off-duty time, like what kind of knife you carry or multi-tool or off-duty firearm, stuff like that. And so the concept of EDC can be applied to information security. So I'm, we're going to talk about what are the tools that we use on a daily basis to kind of protect ourselves and our data. So we're going to start with the biggest one. What is the device that we carry around all the time in our pockets? For me, I use an iPhone and I use an iPhone because I believe that Apple has a better stance on privacy than Google does. When you use an Android phone, you have to sign in with a Google account and the amount of telemetry that Google tracks is not something that I'm comfortable with. And even though a lot of people say, well, there's nothing you can do to kind of prevent Google from doing that. They're going to track you regardless. That is true, but I also believe that I don't need to just readily hand it over to them. I can still try to prevent them from getting the data as much as possible. And also, Android has been fragmented over the years. Different manufacturers have different update schedules. So when Google releases a new version of Android, it has to go through the manufacturer. It has to go through the wireless service provider before it gets updated on your phone. Whereas Apple pushes those security updates and those new versions of the iOS straight from their servers to your phone. Now, if I were to get an Android phone, I would definitely get one that is manufactured by Google, like the Pixel, because those OS patches come directly from Google. So I think if you were to go with an Android phone, that's what I would pick. But I use an iPhone because I believe Apple has better privacy stance, as well as all of their cloud services, like Apple Maps, iCloud Music. Maps is one that... I definitely advocate for because even if you are on an Apple phone and you're using Google Maps, you know, that's again telemetry that is given to Google. So I think Apple Maps is great. It has come a long ways since it first came out and I've never had any issues using it. 100% agreement on everything you just said. I carry an iPhone. I've carried an iPhone since the original. I have dabbled in Android over the years. If you're going to carry an Android phone, you're probably best off with a Google Pixel. Sometimes people get into, and, and especially some technologists who like to get in the weeds under the covers, they become dismissive of Apple strategy where Apple covers up a lot of the complexity of their devices underneath. It doesn't mean they aren't complex. It doesn't mean they aren't really advanced technologically. It's just that a lot of that is not something you can modify. And sometimes you get into arguments over like, oh, well, Apple doesn't really um, believe in privacy. They just think it's a way to differentiate themselves from Google. You know, ultimately, I don't care about the rationale of why. I care about the end result. And it's become a point where Apple absolutely has differentiated themselves on privacy. 100%. That's, that's really not a fact up for debate at this point. If you want to talk about, are they doing it out of the goodness of their hearts or are they doing it because it is diametrically opposite of Google's strategy because Google is incapable of a company as, of adopting that strategy, whatever the case may be, it is. And this is one of the things that, that to me personally, I, I really struggle with because I also think it's pretty much not up for debate that iPhone and iOS has wound up being a superior security model to Android. It has had fewer vulnerabilities over the years. The ones it has had have been 
broadly disclosed and quickly patched and overall just has a better security posture. Not to mention it's easier to deploy and manage in an IT environment because it is consistent across devices, uh, device families, generations, everything else. And so sometimes I see people in information security who have that tinkerer's mindset, like they want to get under the covers. They want to see how everything works. And because of that, they go Android because they can tinker with it. They can poke at it. But I struggle with that because I feel like then when InfoSec says one thing but does another, it's being paternalistic. And also it's not practicing what you preach. If information security is really that important, then demonstrate that by carrying the device that has a proven superior security record and privacy record. Now, this isn't for you to come back and say, well, what about this vulnerability? What about that vulnerability? First off, what about it is is a terrible counter argument in general. So, you know, if you want to make a counter argument, let's, let's work on that a little bit. But secondly, I am not saying that iOS and, and Apple have never had security issues. I am saying they have had less, and I do not think that is really an argument that's up for debate. So certainly um, I'm an iPhone user as well, Andy, for all the reasons you talked about. And do you want to do a plus one on Apple Maps in particular? If you dismissed Apple Maps, by the way, nine years ago when it came out in iOS 6, iOS 15 is going to get announced at Apple's developers conference here in a week or two. Um, it's been nine years. It's worth another look because Apple Maps is darn good. And if you think about the amount of information that actually you send when you're using a mapping application as far as where I am, where I'm going, how long it takes me to get there, the places I'm interested in stopping and shopping along the way, it's pretty astounding. And I still get emails from Google because I do use Google Maps occasionally, and maybe I need to eradicate it from my device entirely, where I'll get an email, they'll be like, hey, how is this restaurant? It's like, how did you know I went there? Oh, well, of course you did because you have permission to my location and blah, 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 blah. Like, I hate that stuff. Like, that's creepy. Don't, don't do that. Um, and so that's just another good example. So we can move along here, but because it's that primary computing platform that's in our pocket and with us all day, I did want to spend a little bit of time elaborating on, on some of my thoughts and theories around it. And just to be upfront, for me, I don't use any Google services. I do have a Google account, which I did use years and years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's hard not to have a Google account these days just to have one, but I don't use it as my primary and I don't have their apps installed on my phone either. With the exception of YouTube, YouTube is notoriously hard to have a replacement for. Mm -hmm. There's a few apps out there that can compete with it, but really nothing that is at the scale that YouTube provides. So that's probably the one exception. Mm -hmm. I will also mention there are people within the information security or privacy industry who look at Android and there are a couple of flavors of Android mm -hmm. that are privacy centric. There's a phone called the e-phone, which is uh, based out in Europe or the fair phone, which has a, vanilla copy of Android that doesn't have any Google services installed. And there are open source libraries with apps that are very similar to Google apps or other Android apps that you can use that are completely open source. There's also a flavor of Android called graphene OS by a security researcher who first developed a version of Android called Copperhead, all very, very secure and privacy oriented without Google services. Now, if you want to use these, you have to root your phone, you have to flash them and you have to maintain them. And with like graphing OS, it does update with the security updates for Google. But when you're without those services, you are severely handicapped. You don't have the same, level of usability. And so that again comes into play where you have this slider of secure versus usability. And if you want to be completely secure, like I do have an old pixel two that I flashed with graphene OS, but it is essentially a phone, a text 
and a browser. And that's all I have installed on it. I don't have any other apps. So it's super secure. It doesn't have any information on it and I can use it, but it's not truly that great of a phone to carry on a daily basis. Moving on to browsers, that's kind of like the next thing that you use all the time on a computer. I use Firefox for the majority of my personal browsing. The extensions that I have installed are uBlock Origin, 1Password, Firefox Containers, and then I turn on DNS over HTTPS, as well as HTTPS only, and I intend to turn on this new feature called Firefox Fission, which is where each domain runs in its own independent process in your computer, which is pr new. They just announced it in the newest version of Firefox, and it's a really great feature. So I use Firefox because they're privacy-oriented. I also use Edge and Brave as Chromium versions for most of my work. I use Edge. And missing from there is Chrome. I, I don't use Chrome at all. I use Chromium browsers, but I don't use Chrome. I'm a mix of Edge and Safari for the most part. I just haven't been able to quite get myself to use Edge full-time on mobile, um, mostly because I run into issues where, and I like this feature, but on mobile, it's just it's a little hard to keep track of the state, where you have both like, my personal Microsoft account profile and my work profile. And it likes to do this auto switching where if you try to load like a work web page, it switches to your work profile, which is awesome. But then it stays there. And then I get a link in a text message and I tap on it. And if I leave Edge as my default, now it opens it in my work profile. And now that history has saved my Azure Active Directory account. And I don't really like work seeing that. Um, so that's something I'm trying to kind of figure out how to work around. And it's not really that fall to the browser necessarily, but it's just kind of a, a side effect of, of it trying to be helpful is actually it's, it's somewhat um, something I'm not comfortable with. So generally I just keep that in Safari because then I kind of keep that separation of work versus non-work, even though on the desktop, I also do my personal browsing in edge as well as work, because for me, it's just easier to, to have my go-to browser and I just switch the profiles as needed. And I do think, I am, I'm more comfortable with, with Microsoft's stance on privacy than Google's. Um, I should I disclose as always that I do work for Microsoft, although not on the Edge browser, not on any teams that are involved with this. And um, to me, I'm, I'm satisfied with kind of the privacy policy and some of the tracking, blocking, and ad prevention that's built into the browser. Um, if I am doing something where I really maybe don't want to leave a trail for whatever reason, I do have Brave installed and fire it up on occasion. And um, that, that's pretty much for the most part me. I, I really love what Firefox does conceptually. It's just not something I've gotten into because I, I don't know, it just seems like another browser to get in the way in, in my case where, where my needs are kind of met by what I have. From a, a blocking and, and protection perspective, I, I use what's built in the browser. I don't turn it on like the paranoid mode. I usually do like the middle setting, but I also have at home, I have an Eero system and Eero has really nice um, capability that's like a step up charge, like it's $99 a year. You get an encrypt me VPN, you get one password for families, and you also get um, ad blocking and, and malicious site blocking through Zscaler. So when I turn that on and actually automatically redirects all my DNS requests to Zscaler, and they use that to do DNS level blocking of tracking sites, ad sites, advertisements, malicious sites, et cetera. So my whole network at home benefits from that at a network level, and I don't have to do any care and feeding about it, which is super nice. You know, I know there's much more geeky things you can do where you can stand up a pie hole or a ubiquity system or whatever. Um, but for me, I I'm, have a young family, so that's that's hard for me to do. And so just having like a flip a switch and it's good. I love that. And I certainly, we've had Zscaler on the show in the past. I, I really love and trust the work they do. And so it's nice to just kind of have a network protection as a service, if you will, that I just throw them money and they protect everything at home. Um, I have that encrypt me VPN, which I could use when I'm out and about, but candidly, I don't um, because I have a, another VPN on my device that I, that I use instead. So um, 
big ups, big respect to the Firefox team. They keep doing amazing work and I really think they're driving the web forward, but I do, I do hope they they're able to stay relevant and stick around. I have concerns about them, you know, having enough critical mass to continue to exist. And it's one of those things where, again, I can like say, Hey, I love Firefox. They're great. But then I also admit that I don't use it, which is potentially part of the problem. I think lots of people love Firefox as a concept, but don't use it. I remember when, you know, it was, uh, I think like 18 months ago now when Microsoft announced they were going to discontinue building the edge rendering engine, because edge used to be a separate rendering engine that was distinct from WebKit and what's Chrome. Is it blink? Um, and whatever Firefox is, it's gecko. I think whatever uh, underlying rendering engine edge had its own and it was different from the old, like internet Explorer Trident one. And Microsoft said, we're going to stop making a rendering engine. We're just going to use Chromium. And everyone like lost their mind. Like this is bad for the web. You know, we need more rendering engines. We need rendering engine diversity, but nobody used edge. So, you know, sometimes if, if you feel really strongly about it, make sure you're doing enough to, to actively use it because as I just kind of walk through here, talking out loud, I love what Firefox does, but I'm guilty of not using it. And I'm part of the problem, I guess I could say. So if you love a security tool, make sure you support it. I didn't mention on the mobile too. I use edge and Safari just like you do. And I also have that issue. So what I generally do is for outlook, which is my work email client, mm -hmm. I have that default to edge. And so it's always in the work profile. And then for anything else, I use Safari and I've used other That's a good tip. browsers. Yeah. I've used other browsers as well on iOS. Firefox focus is one that comes up to mind in the duck, duck go app as well. Those work. Okay. But for the most part, Safari just has a better integration with the Apple ecosystem. Mm -hmm. For example, being able to use Apple pay on websites directly from the Safari browser is really, really awesome. Like if I have an invoice, I have to pay and then it allows me to do Apple pay. Whereas it doesn't do that for the other browsers. So right. sometimes you just sacrifice the privacy aspect. And again, Apple, I'm comfortable with Apple's stance on privacy. So I think that's a sacrifice that I'm willing to make there. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. And that's a good tip. So to solve my browser woes, set Outlook to open an edge because it has an independent setting independent of like the operating system level browser default, which finally came out in iOS 14 and leave the operating system level default still set to Safari. I think I'm going to change mine to that because I've been wrestling with it. And honestly, you just solved it for me right now. So maybe some of our listeners that'll help too. Awesome. So messaging apps, we had an entire episode dedicated to this, but we'll just touch on this real quick. I use signal and iMessage for the most part. Signal is what I generally use with a bunch of information security folks who have it. I use it with my family for the most part. And iMessage is the default app on the Apple iPhone, which I have a bunch of people who use iPhones as well. Now, if they don't have an iPhone, it defaults to the SMS protocol, which we all know is insecure. But those are the two messaging apps that I go to. I do have other apps that I use, but one of them, which is pretty popular, like WhatsApp, I actually deleted my account for WhatsApp. If you listen to our message episode, you'll know that Facebook has been exerting more and more pressure on WhatsApp to give them telemetry. So I removed that and deleted my account. I'm in the same boat on messaging, although I, I don't think I use signal as much as you do for the most part. Signal is like my group of work buddies when we want to talk about work outside of work kind of thing. Um, and then I message pretty much for everybody else. And then I don't talk to people who have green bubbles. If you do, I shun you. <laughs> and, and I'm, I'm only halfway joking for the most part. I, I pretty much don't have friends who use Android minus a very, very limited few. 
Um, I message, you know, go bit listen to our messaging show because we broke this down in great depth. iMessage itself is end-to-end -end encrypted. That's awesome. Nobody can view your iMessages but you and the recipient, not even Apple. However, if your iMessages are backed up to iCloud in any way, and there's two different ways they could get backed up to iCloud, either A, as a device backup, or B, if you have iMessages in the cloud turned on, either one of those are potentially subject to a law enforcement subpoena because that data is stored in the cloud and Apple has the potential to, to decrypt those. Um, and there's some nuance to it. So again, go listen to the messaging episode because we looked it up and explained it in better depth. But just know like if you're really privacy and security conscious around messaging, iMessage is theoretically secure, but then there are some caveats around like how you would have to use it to be in a totally secure manner. So I'll, I'll say I, iMessage is probably 99% of my messaging and I do have iMessages in the cloud turned on because it's super convenient. It syncs your state across all your devices, but I am aware that there are some security implications of that. And for the most part, again, that goes back to, are you comfortable with who runs those systems? Do they tend to try to fight law enforcement subpoenas if they're overly broad or not detailed enough? And the answer to all that is yes. So that's, that's kind of where I'm at. Um, but again, we, we went through this in a lot more depth. So signal and iMessage is my combination too. I really, I, I will admit from time to time, sometimes there's people that the only way I know how to reach them is Facebook messenger, which gives me the chills just saying it, but it's true. And a lot of people are in the same boat. Like, it's great to have kind of draw your lines and your limits of where you are and aren't willing to go. But sometimes for like social friction or lack of friction, you just kind of have to go where the people are. And so like, if I need to talk to some people, that's the only way I know how to get to them. So I'll, I'll admit to that too, but very, very, very limited use. And it's usually something boring, like, Hey neighbor, can I put something in your trash can? Cause mine is full. So anyhow. <laughs> Well, we'll just skip to social media here because you brought up Facebook. Mm -hmm. The only social media that I have these days is LinkedIn, Twitter, and Snapchat. And I only keep Snapchat around just for kicks. I don't really use it all that often. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn, pretty active on Twitter. Mm -hmm. I deleted my Facebook. It's been about eight months now. And honestly, I've been pretty happy with the decision. Deleted Instagram as well. So any Facebook apps in general. Um, and so if you've watched any of the documentaries on Netflix about the Cambridge Analytica breach and you know the way that Facebook has been stepping up and just basically ignoring privacy advocates and what they want, it was the right decision for me. Although I do admit that there are several of my family members mainly who live in other countries that it has been harder to get a, not necessarily get a hold of them, but to stay in touch, to stay up on where they are in their lives. And so it does take a little bit more effort to reach out to them. And my wife and my parents still have their accounts. So, you know, I can still stay up that way, but for me, I don't miss it. And it was the right decision for me. I, I wish I was as brave as you. So it, it is, and I will fully admit this, there is a, to me in my mind, a bit of a social stigma for people who aren't on there entirely. Although I find Facebook as a company horrible, just awful, terrible company. Um, I, I question if Zuckerberg is even fully human. He seems like a cyborg at this point that's devoid of emotion. Um, it, it's, it's really incredible. Um, just how awful they are and how bent they are on increasing engagement at all costs, which um, at this point turns out to be democracy, liberty, privacy. I mean, just the destruction of everything um, is in the search of more engagement. So I, I, I struggle with this all of the time. If you feel like me, then you're not alone. Um, I wish I was as brave as you, Andy. Let's just put it that way. Um, and I, I think about it regularly. So I have not pulled the plug yet. But I will say one thing I do is I really do compartmentalize kind of how I use different social media platforms. So I, um, I, on, on the other tools, I, I find they're really ineffective if you're not like a public profile. 
So I keep it public, but I limit what I disclose on there. I do not share everything in like a public facing profile. So there's many things about my personal life that I just don't talk about or mention or bring up or have any reference to in public facing personas. And so it's, it's just a matter of, to me, like, there are things I feel comfortable sharing in, in a Facebook setting where everything is limited to friends list only. And Facebook at least has that double opt-in model where we both must agree to become friends. I like that model and I like and trust sharing it with that curated list of friends more than I do broadcasting something publicly. So I treat those extremely differently where there's a lot of things on my Facebook profile that are not shared anywhere else. And I think that's a good practice too. Um, and it's not, again, like you're hiding anything. It's just, there's some things you just don't need to broadcast publicly. The names of your children, how many children you have, where they go to school, what they do, like Facebook, maybe that's fine, especially if you're really conscientious of who's on your friends list, but maybe not on your Twitter feed because Twitter's kind of worthless. If you have a private Twitter profile, like I, I just don't see the value in that. Like if you want to be private on Twitter, then just don't use it, you know? So um, say social media is a weird thing. I, I totally understand and respect. And honestly, I, I think the, the privacy implications of these social networks is terrible. What they have done to so many of our institutions is terrible. Um, and I wrestle with it regularly and, and maybe someday soon I will get the guts to pull the plug as well because many of them are toxic. But what I do also do is limit my exposure to them. So I just don't spend a lot of time scrolling Facebook because in all honesty, I don't care what most of those people think. Like I don't get a lot of value out of that. So a quick surf, like five minutes a day and I'm good. Like I do not need to sit on there all day because most of those people are jerks. And I don't care what they're saying. Um, Twitter again, also can be super toxic in, in other ways, in other directions. So be very conscientious about how you use them, know your limits and know when to step away. Um, there are times when I will step away from different social media platforms, depending on like the news of the day, because I know like this discussion is not going to be valuable. Like you need to let things settle a little bit before we can have a measured and rational discussion around them. But early on, it's going to be a bunch of people screaming, the sky is falling and that's not really helpful either. So anyhow, we could do a whole episode on social media and maybe we should, but those are some of the things I think about when we, when we talk about like our everyday carry. And I'll just, mention one final point on this i didn't go cold turkey like <laughs> and delete everything off in one day so if you're curious just as a quick side note mm -hmm. it was a process i started with cutting off people from posting on my timeline which was a very easy decision i didn't want people to just straight up post something on my timeline they could message and react to something that i wrote or reply to something that I wrote, but I just didn't have them posting stuff. That kind of evolved, just like for you, Adam, I, I limit what people could see, what information that I had, privacy. But one of the things that I consciously made a decision for was I deleted all the photos of my kids as well as I stopped posting photos of my kids. And it was really because of an article that I read about how when you do that as a parent, kids aren't able to give consent for that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, later on, it's something that they may be embarrassed about that you, you know, posted on your social media. So I took that to heart because I understand consent and they may not have that ability to say, I will, I'm okay with you posting this. So I just went ahead and deleted all my photos of my kids and I didn't post anything of my kids and if there was something that I wanted to share I would share it just privately with the friends and family that I wanted to share with mm -hmm. and then as I was moving down this kind of weaning myself off of Facebook the biggest thing was deleting the app off my phone and then using the browser to log in and so that was you know I had to like conscientiously use the browser to log in that'll drive you away right there because <laughs> it's yep, so bad that yeah that limited a lot of my time mm -hmm. and then I deactivated my account which Facebook allows you to do without repercussions you can just deactivate your account at any time and not use it mm -hmm. and I found that I didn't need it right and so after that I deleted it so it was a process and you know you can kind of follow that same process or wean yourself off and see if it impacts you at all and isn't it sad that 
there is a process, right? I mean, that, that's how <laughs> intertwined it has become that it's not something that's really easy to just snap your fingers. It's kind of amazing mm -hmm. you walking through it. So another thing that people use all the time is a search engine, which mm -hmm. also has privacy implications. I don't use Google search. Just like I mentioned, I don't use any Google services for the most part. I use DuckDuckGo as my main search engine, and I've been using that for over five, six years now. And it is a great replacement for Google. The main thing it does is that every single person's search is the same. So for example, if I were to search Chinese restaurants, if that was in a Google search, it would tailor it to me because it knows what my telemetry is and knows where I live. It's going to search for Chinese restaurants in Madison. If it were to do, if Adam were to search for Chinese restaurants in Google, it would probably pop up with Chinese restaurants in Des Moines. Mm -hmm. But if I were to search for any other thing in DuckDuckGo, if I were to search Chinese restaurants in DuckDuckGo and Adam were to do the same thing, the search results would be exactly the same because it doesn't tailor it to the person's telemetry. So it's a great replacement. It gives you the consistent search results. And I haven't had any issues finding things on the internet using that search engine in five, six years. So don't laugh, but I am a bit of a company man here. I, I literally <laughs> do use Bing. A um, couple of reasons why. So number one, again, I'm a company man and I know who signs my paychecks, but all joking aside, we've talked about, I kind of find Microsoft's privacy policy and, and privacy attitude with Satya Nadella saying very loudly and openly that we believe privacy is a fundamental human right, that I, I feel a little more comfortable with that. And you mentioned the tailoring of search results and there is value in that, right? I mean, it's a double-edged sword because it requires having some knowledge of your search history, your location, your preferences, your web history to understand how to deliver the best results. And with Google, again, that gets creepy. And Bing does a lot of that same stuff, but I just trust Microsoft to be a better steward of my data. And I like that. But the other thing too, and this is where, you know, I'm not being an LOL company man is there's something called Bing for business, which is if your company opts in, which Microsoft does, when you do a search, it will actually return work-related results at the top. And this is super handy because I can search for something and maybe I'm looking for it in either internal or external documentation because like 99% of my web searches are gonna be like Microsoft Cloud App Security documentation or whatever. So getting to hit that is an internal SharePoint site as well as like the external facing documentation, super handy. And then there's other benefits to it as well, like being rewards, like the more you use it, you, you can get points that can be used for gift cards and stuff. So, I, I mean, totally get all of the concern and, and like you, Andy, I've tried to de-Google myself as much as possible. I think I have a couple steps to take it farther than you, but I do almost nothing with Google services today and I, I replace them when and where possible. And so that's what I've done. And I will tell you a funny story just so um, y'all don't completely laugh at me here. When I am like talking to a customer, I find it like it would be really bad if I were to say, oh, you know, just Google this. Like people use it as a verb. And if I were to try to like, you know, be really company man like it, I said, just bing it. Like <laughs> it sounds dumb. And I don't do that just to be clear. So what I do is I just generically say, do a web search for blah, blah, blah. And that way, like I'm not pimping the competition, but I'm also not like sounding so, you know, ridiculous company guy that I'm using our search engine with, you know, nowhere near the, the usage share that, that Google search engine has. Um, and that way it comes off more like generically. So I avoid using the term Google as a verb. I just prefer to do a web search and that works fine. And that's like a really inoffensive way to communicate it. And so, um, if you are a, a, you know, security practitioner and you're using a third party engine and you just want to, I get into like the psychology of this sometimes, you know, Andy, you use DuckDuckGo. So if you don't want to sit there and like subconsciously say like, oh, Google it, you're, you're trying to get people not to use that. So what's a subtle way to do it? You just say, do a web search for it. And that way you're not suggesting like which engine to use, which as we 
try to get people to be more privacy and security conscious as they think about which tools they use. That's a subtle way all of us, everyone listening to this show, can maybe help step back from suggesting a particular brand of search engine every single time we're telling somebody to do a web search because there's more than one way to do it at this point for sure. And there's, there's legitimately very, very good tools to do it. And I will just say, if you've used DuckDuckGo, the, the results are excellent. And actually, most people never give it a shot, but if you use Bing, I, I've used it every day for like four years now because I made the switch. Um, the results are fine. Like I, I never have to like, oh, I need to go to Google to find it because these other search engines stink. Like they have you convinced that's the case, like nobody else delivers good search results. And that is just not true. You do not need to go to them anymore. Um, they, they absolutely had the best search results for a very, very, very long time. But that actual gap in reality today is small to non-existent where these other engines deliver very, very good search results. The number of times where I like looked for something in one engine, then went to the other, like went to Google and found what I was looking for that that's never happened to me, like never. So I encourage you to make the switch, do your research, look at different privacy policies, different standards on if they do, um, some tailoring to your personal, you know, history and preferences and figure out what's right for you. For me, I like the tailoring, but I don't like Google doing the tailoring. I felt more comfortable with Microsoft doing it. So that's why I made the switch. Um, if you don't want the tailoring at all, DuckDuckGo is a great option, but you have choices. And again, it's hard. It's a little scary, right? Because we've been so programmed that this is the one way to search and my ultimate point to you is that doesn't matter. And let's, let's work together to use more inclusive language when we talk about web search to encourage people to evaluate other options. My email, I switched off of Gmail also about five, six years ago. I went to ProtonMail, which is a Swiss-based company that is privacy-oriented. They encrypt their email data servers within these mountains in Switzerland. <laughs> It's pretty, it's pretty awesome. Um, I actually bought into them as a lifetime member a few years ago when they offered that. So I was pretty lucky to get it. It was expensive at the time, but I'm glad I pulled the trigger on, on that. So I pay for their services and you know, that gives me access to their Proton VPN. It gives me access to all of their upcoming features and it gives me basically the top tier of storage and messages and, and whatnot. So uh, I like them as a service. They have a free tier as well that you can use. And, you know, just like search engines, it is very, very difficult and scary to switch off your main email. You know, I did it by just forwarding all my emails from one service to the other one and keeping them still in my, you know, original Gmail account. And then through time, as you reply to your contacts, they'll get your new email. And so that, that was what I did. And I've been pretty happy with proton mail. How's the, um, spam filtering in proton mail. It's all right. It's all right. I, I've built it up through the years as well with custom rules. So when I first started, there wasn't much of a spam filter back then there is a much better one now. It has some heuristics built in. If you text that you're deleting a certain email a lot from a certain sender or domain, it will filter it to the spam folder. It doesn't recognize all the spam that like a Gmail would. And so there is more tailoring that you have to do as far as rules and your own filters. But that took some time from when I migrated and filtered everything over, forward everything over from my Gmail account. So I think this is this is a hard one for people to migrate from because if we're being super candid, this is where we just talked about with search engines and I made the point that there isn't that functional gap as much. It's still there in email providers. So I have like an account at all the email providers and I like load them all on my Outlook app on my phone. So, you know, if I get an email at my Yahoo account, I see it. If I get one at my Outlook.com account, I see it. If I get one at my Gmail, I see it. And 
they all stink at spam. Like I've barely given out those addresses and they still get a lot of spam compared to my Gmail account, which is pretty darn solid. I mean, it's you know one or two messages a week. And so this is where I'm going to, I'm going to give our listeners a pass. Like if you just haven't, you know, had the guts to make the move yet. Oh, and by the way, Apple's like the worst of this, like the at me.com accounts or at iCloud.com accounts. Oh, so bad. Um, their, their filtering is just horrendous. Um, this is, this is where there is a real functional advantage. And so this is where you weigh that difference because, oh, heck yeah. And Google does a lot of monitoring of your Gmail account and mining it for data and mining it for activity. By the way, have you ever wondered why your Amazon receipts don't have any listing of anything you've purchased in them anymore? Go buy something on Amazon and go look at the email you get. Adam, thanks for your order. You ordered one items that cost $54 and 92 cents. They don't list the items in there because Google was scraping them. Yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting one, right? So, um, email is a treasure trove of data about you. So you should be conscientious about it, but at the same time, it's such a primary workload. And if you get a ton of junk, it makes it really hard to use. So I personally, I, I have a Gmail account that dates back to when you had to get an invite to Gmail and it's one gig of storage was a huge deal. Yeah. Back in what? Oh, four Oh five timeframe. And I, you know, I haven't been able to let go of it. I, I barely use like personal email anyways. Like it's a conduit for like password resets at this point and like where my receipts go when I order something, but like nobody like emails me to talk. Like that's just, it's not really a thing anymore. But, um, if I were going to, if I were to like go to a privacy conscious solution, I would look at like a proton mail as well. Um, if you have a Microsoft 365 account for families, Part of that is you do get a premium Outlook.com account along with it. And Outlook.com is based on like the exact same code base as the commercial Office 365 Outlook webmail client. So it's, if you haven't looked at it in many years back, like, you know, when it was Hotmail, it's amazing. Like it's really, really powerful, great UI, really easy to use, really clean, really well done. Uh, there's a lot to like there and you do get premium features like it becomes ad free if you're a paid Microsoft 365 subscriber. So if you want like a commercial email platform, that's not like a proton mail and, and still built on a, a pretty broadly used like consumer facing email platform, but you want to pay for it and, and take away like some of that ad supported model, that's an option as well. Because if you have that, that paid Microsoft 365 for families, you get that included. And so it bumps up like your email storage, you get ad free, you get a couple of things that come with it. So that's another paid option. And in general, by the way, you know, we kind of haven't mentioned this throughout this whole conversation, but if you really care about a service and you really want it to be um, not just ad ad supported, you get that by paying for it. So if you really like any of the stuff we're talking about, you pay for it, and then you're probably going to have a better experience, a more private experience, a a more respectful experience because of the fact that you are now a paying customer. So um, just want to throw that out there. Yeah, and since I don't use Gmail, mm -hmm. I also don't use Google Calendars, which is what a lot of people do to track their things. I use Outlook.com, my MSA calendar, as my main calendar, which has a lot of benefits. When you sign into a Windows computer, it has my work email, it has my work calendar, it has my um, personal calendars all in the Outlook app, which you can sync with iOS as well. So it's it's my one stop as far as... Uh, calendars goes and I do sometimes use my outlook.com email as well not as much but um, and so that kind of brings me to cloud storage a lot of different cloud storage options out there because I pay for Microsoft 365 my MSA I use the calendars I also use OneDrive the personal side for my the majority of my cloud storage you get one terabyte per user and then you get up to five users and it also has something called a personal vault, which was a feature that was released probably within the last year mm -hmm. or so. And it's an encrypted vault within your OneDrive that you can store sensitive things. Now I don't use that part of it too much. I use another tool called Veracrypt, which is a little bit clunkier because it's an open source encryption tool. And what it does is you designate a container 
for a certain size and you encrypt it. Why it's clunky is because let's say, for example, I designate a 10 gig container to put all of my sensitive documents in. Well, when I modify that container, meaning I decrypt it and I upload new documents to it, or I change some of the files within that container, well, then the code base, the file hash of that container has now changed. And so it has to re-upload the 10 gigs back to OneDrive and it has to download it each time. And so it's a little bit clunky in how it use, uses the feature, but it is the most secure method. So if you're really wanting to store sensitive documents, I would personally use Veracrypt. Now for other documentation, like for example, I keep copies of my driver's license, my passport, you know, those sorts of things digitally. I will keep a copy of that in the personal vault because it's easy to access on mobile. I cannot access my Veracrypt vault on a mobile phone. Mm -hmm. I have to do it on a computer. So that's the downfall of that. But that's like really, really sensitive stuff. Like my social security card, like a copy of that. I'm not going to put that in my personal vault. It's not that I don't trust Microsoft. I do, but there's a level of acceptable risk that I'm just not comfortable with there. So the, again, there's always trade-offs, right? So things that I want to access on my mobile phone, I would put in the personal vault things that are secure that I don't feel comfortable with and I don't need to access on my personal phone. I use Veracrypt all through OneDrive. I think for the, the big three cloud storage providers, so Dropbox, Box, OneDrive, I, I think for the most part, their privacy status is going to be pretty similar. I think they're all pretty good about that. They're going to leave your stuff alone. Again, unless law enforcement shows up with a valid subpoena, then they are required to comply with it. And I, I think their default offering is not doing any sort of like customer key encryption where they wouldn't have the ability to decrypt it. Because it, when that's the case, that obfuscates the data to the the cloud storage provider, in which case things like indexing, search, all that breaks. You can't do any of that. And so all the things in personal vault in OneDrive, that's how it works, where for that stuff, even if Microsoft were served with a valid law enforcement subpoena, they can't provide them the information that's in personal vault because they don't hold the key to it. You do. Um, and so that's like the fundamental difference with personal vault. And, and as a result, like nothing in it is indexed. Like you can't do a search for it, like a, a text string that's in a text document in personal vault because the Microsoft service side can't make heads or tails of it. Um, so it's really good for those sorts of things Andy is talking about. But for the most part, I think you just go with the one that, you know, makes the most sense to you pricing wise um, and, and feature wise and, and, support wise, like supports all the things you want to do. Dropbox has been so ubiquitous in that almost every other cloud provider has like an API to link into them. So for example, Riverside FM, which is what Andy and I use to record the show. It's what we're using right now as we talk. Um, they have an integration with Dropbox where I can automatically sync all our recordings to a Dropbox account. Well, neither one of us use Dropbox, so we can't use that. So that would be a, you know, a feather in Dropbox's cap, but at the same time, the amount of storage you get with a OneDrive account is stupid for the money uh, because the Microsoft 365 account for families includes, it's $99 a year, and it includes up to six accounts for your family. And each one of those gets a terabyte of storage. So and effectively, it's six terabytes of storage, plus, oh, by the way, you know, premium email and outlook.com, plus you get access to all of the Office client apps on Mac and PC and iOS and Android. Um, for $99 a year. Like nobody's touching that price. It's incredible. Um, and so it's a really good value. And, and again, I think for the most part, the privacy is all the same. And like Andy talked about, if there is stuff that you would want to have where you hold the key, a tool like a Veracrypt is a great option to do it. A couple other tools that we use uh, for endpoint protection on my Windows PC, I just use Defender. We've talked about endpoint protection and how far Defender has gotten. I think it's by far the best endpoint protection out there, as well as the fact that it's included with your Windows and there's no additional cost. So on Mac, I don't use anything. I think the basic protections for Mac OS are pretty good. It obviously depends on what applications you're installing and when you get prompted for those administrator prompts, what you're 
doing with those. So you want to obviously be careful with what you're downloading and installing. But basic Mac protection has come a long ways as well. And we had Matt Benio and Matthew Ward on the show where they talked about how the native Mac OS protects itself. So um, go and listen to that episode if you want to get a little bit deeper on the Mac protection as far as endpoint. But um, yeah, I don't use anything on my Macs. I don't use anything on my iOS or Android devices. I just use Defender for Endpoint on my Windows computer. Agreed. And if you're going to use Defender for Endpoint on your Windows PC, make sure you don't have like an expired other solution that is still enabled as the primary antivirus and is expired, so it's not doing anything. So if you bought like a PC at a Best Buy or an Office Depot or something, and again, this is probably not really our audience, but things to look at if you're looking at, you know, your grandma's PC or something. Uh, they'll, we'll, they'll ship with like a trial of something else and then the trial will expire, but it won't fail over to just go back to the, the built-in uh, Microsoft Defender for endpoint capabilities. And honestly, again, that's that's really all you need. Best way to get there is just uninstall whatever, you know, trial where it came with the PC and you'll be good to go. Just go to the Windows Security Center and validate that it's showing that you're using that real-time protection delivered through Defender, and, you, and you're going to be in a really, really good place. I think this is, agree with you, a place where I wouldn't spend money on anything else. And like you on the Mac, I'm not using any any third-party stuff because there is a, a built-in tool from Apple called X-Protect, which is kind of signature-based, but will will knock out anything that's known to be malicious. Otherwise, the Mac has Gatekeeper built in and turned on by default, and you should leave it turned on, where it will refuse to run any code that isn't signed by Apple or, um, I forget the exact term for a developer, but they can essentially, it's it's like, um, oh, what, what are the people, Andy, in, in life that, you know, if you need to get a document notarized, that's the word I was looking for. So developers, even if they're not in the Mac App Store, can notarize their application and that will pass Gatekeeper as well, um, depending on your settings. But anything else, like if you just downloaded this from Bob's random software site, Mac OS is going to like throw a fit if you try to run it. And so by all means, if you're going to go through that process of saying, yes, I really want to run this. Yes, I'm going to put in my admin password. Be prepared for the consequences that come with that. But for the most part, a default Mac OS installation is not going to run unsigned code, and that's going to really limit your your attack vector for stuff to get into your system short of pretty much like a zero day which you know if you keep patched you're you're going to protect yourself as good as you can so i'm agreed on that front we can cut this out adam when we go back and edit real quick but do you want to touch on anything else here or you think i mean we can we call can... the show okay because yeah. it's it's been like 52 minutes now <laughs> yep let's do it <laughs> all right well, this was a great conversation about some of the tools that we use. I hope you guys took away some tips. I always like hearing about other people's tools and what they like to use and the reasons why they do it. So if you have better ideas or better tools, something that we haven't heard of, by all means, message us and say, hey, take a look at this. Have you heard of this before? I would love to hear tips about what you guys use in your daily lives, your your digital everyday carry. That's our show for this week. Thanks for listening as always. Our contact information will be in the show notes and we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.